right? Is he shedding his blood so you can get your sins forgiven or because they've been forgiven? How, how many think he's shedding his blood so you can get them forgiven? You see your hands. How many think because they've been forgiven? That's the answer. But boy, you tell that to a Christian. He don't even know what that thing is. Because when he quotes, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, he is always thinking about Christ's blood. And the passage on without shedding of blood is not a reference to Christ's blood. It's a reference to the blood of bulls and goats. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's the law. So, excuse me just a minute, Brother Elmore. Is that why uh, a lot of times it says many instead of all? From many the Old Testament, from back to the Old Testament. I never thought about that, but that, yeah, yeah, I never thought about that, but that'd go, yeah, that'd go, yeah, that'd where Cowan get off on that. Uh, Dr. Ruffin, where you're, Brother Ruffin, where you're talking right here. <laughs> kind of complicated. You ever said, he's talking out of the Old Testament, right? Yes. In Matthew 26. Yes. And it's not actually talking to me. Well, it's, it's talking to you in the sense that when that blood is shed, the death of the testator, then the New Testament is in effect. His blood hasn't been shed yet. That's right. You're right. It's not an effect yet. It's not an effect. It's not an effect until the next chapter. Technically, everything in Matthew up to chapter 27 is Old Testament. Boy, tell that to a Christian. On right, Acts 2, and let's pick up the last one. Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38. <laughs> There's the text for it. I heard some person work around the street this afternoon dealing with some lady and she was reading that. Who was that? Who had that? Yeah. What was she trying to prove that? She didn't have the Holy Ghost or got yeah, the Holy Ghost? I had to talk to her. She, she had to get the Holy Ghost? Yes, yeah, Was that her text to prove she had it? Or oh. your text to show her she needed it or what? No, she didn't know that. Oh, that was her text to show you that you needed it? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Acts 2.38. You see, in the, in, the devil, in the devil's smart, see, the Bible says when you get saved, the Bible says when you get saved, you're baptized by the Holy Spirit into Jesus Christ. All right, now to keep you from believing that, the devil has two things he does. He quotes Acts 2.38 to prove that you weren't really baptized in Jesus Christ unless you were baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. And the second thing is, he'll prove you weren't really baptized in Christ unless you have the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost by talking in tongues. If that were just both those denominations are satanic theologies to prevent you from having assurance of your salvation. When you got saved, you were put into Christ. The Holy Spirit puts you into Christ. You don't have to get baptized more or talk in tongues. When you got saved, you're in. Or Acts 2.38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now here it comes again. For the remission of sin. Does that mean he's telling them to bat get baptized so they can have them forgiven or because they've been forgiven? Because they've been forgiven. Just like it means every time you find it. There isn't one place in the Bible where for the remission of sins doesn't mean because they've been forgiven. Now, I don't know why folks can't get that. Look at this sentence here. You can get me somebody to give a little thing like that, you see. Now, Christ died for our sins. Uh, did he die uh, so we could sin, or did he die because of our sins? Because. So you don't have to get the Greek to get that. That word, if a man is jailed for, for stealing, he's not jailed so he can steal. <laughs> he's jailed because he stole. In other words, every sin that's ever been committed has been paid for. They're all paid. I'll pay you. you get saved over here, you're forgiven because blood has been shed, you're propitiated because the payment has been made, you're redeemed because the atonement is final, you're clear because God can clear you on the grounds of this. So when you die, you don't go to an intermediate state. Amen. You go straight up. Right there. <laughs> right there. That's right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Christ died for no other sin but no, I didn't know it. That's about it. Yeah, that's about it. No, no, I was just doing what God told him to do. But right now, we know that you can. Yes, that's it. No, I think he couldn't have. Not possible. Not, not a word to the effect that he ever did. The word is that to the effect. The word is that when God told a man to do something, he did it. 
God said to Noah, build an ark. It's done. God said to Abraham, believe your seed's going to be like the stars. Done. God said to Moses, set up the law, keep the law. They did it. God said in Acts 2, repent and be baptized. They were. God says to you, believe the Lord Jesus Christ. You do or you don't. Yes, sir. You made a statement while I thought that uh, you could be saved in, in the Old Testament. Yes. Is, is this the same kind of salvation we have? No. <laughs> no, the man saved here, he's not in Christ. Christ has no body. The Holy Spirit doesn't indwell him. And he can leave him. David was worried about it in Psalm 51. When a man is saved here, he's not spiritually circumcised. He's physically circumcised. When a man is saved here, he's not bone of Christ's bone and flesh of his flesh. And when a man is saved here, he's not born again. He's still in an Adam's fallen image. So when they sinned, when, like when David messed up two times, so yes, sir. he was lost. No, no, he wasn't, but he was, he was in the virgin, and he knew he could. He said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He could have. He could have. That's why the homeless people like that passage. We got to close, folks. It's five minutes to ten. One question back yonder. A nine. <laughs> Twelve. Nine, ten. Yes, sir. Go back to uh, the beginning of the Old Testament. You mentioned prayers trying to get you I'm sorry, brother. I'm a little, little hard of hearing. Did you go through the redeemed, uh, forgiveness, propitiation, redeeming prayers, like you did when you were down in the board? All right. Uh, let, me put, let me put out all these words together where... Now these are Bible words, and you don't find these uh, in uh, most books and most, most preachers' sermons don't have these, these words in them. But these are the great words of the Bible. Yeah, these are these are things that have to do with the cross. Uh, Humiliation? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he can. Let's <laughs> see, and any others? Well, all right, I'll come through it again. In the Old Testament, God could forgive them, and he could... There's the word. In the Old Testament... God could forgive them and he could remit them, but he couldn't clear them because it was impossible the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. So there has to be a time, sometime in history, when God himself makes the payment. Why does God have to make the payment? Well, two reasons. It has to be a perfect payment, and a thought you may, maybe you never thought about is the fact that God let sin come in. Now, that's something to think about. See? I won't go any further with that. Just drop that right there. But if any man ever says, how come the sin got in? Well, the answer to that is, well, the Lord paid for it if it did. So the next move is yours. All right, so God, so God came in and made a perfect payment and propitiation for these sins. And by doing that, he not only redeems a sinner up here who trusts him, he redeems all the sins that were committed back here. They're brought back. Therefore, any man forgiven and uh, remitted back here can now get to heaven up they come with Christ Matthew 27 Ephesians mm -hmm. chapter 4 all right when Christ makes this atonement it's complete it pays for the whole works past, present, future it's eternal therefore a man who receives him here is not just forgiven and remitted he's cleared and he's redeemed and so when he dies he goes straight up mm -hmm. now these are the words redemption is the buying back of something if it's in relation to you, God buys you back from the devil. The Son of Man has come to give his life as a ransom for many. If it's in redemption to, in relation to sins, that's God paying for the sins that were committed back here. Substitution. That's a, a sacrifice taking your place right here, just like the bull and goat took it back yonder. Adoption. When you accept that sacrifice, you're adopted into God's family as a child of God, and Israel is called my son. Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4. My firstborn. Uh, propitiation. Propitiation is a payment 
And it's a little bit different than redemption. In redemption, here's a thing that's uh, in the hop shop, and I lay down the money and get the thing out. In propitiation, uh, here's one fellow over here, and here's one fellow over here, and they're mad at each other, and there's something that's unsettled between them. And a third party comes in and settles that thing between them, and then they shake hands and forgive and forget. That's propitiation. Propitiation is a payment that reconciles two parties. Took place here. When he dies here, he satisfies God, he satisfies me. Uh, oh, that's, that's a, yeah, that's right. Well, oh, that's it. You couldn't want any better than that. All right, propitiation, expiation. Expiation is a purging or burning of uh, sin. That is, this thing here, expiation is a, that aspect of his death is a, is a, a whole bunch of sins with, uh, with the blood uh, going through them and cleaning them out, uh, wiping them out, uh, blotting them out. It's a, it's a doing away with sin. Uh, justification. When you take Christ your Savior, this is a judicial act. This is, that, that isn't something that took place here. But when you trust what was done here, uh, God makes a declaration in heaven and says, that's probably right. The devil says, no, he's not. The Lord says, yes, he is. And the devil says, the basis of what? The Lord says, the basis of this. So justification. By sanctification. Sanctification is being set apart. This thing here uh, is outside the camp. It's, it's set apart so that any sinner who trusts it, he's set apart. That is, he becomes one with Christ. He's in Christ's death, Romans 6. He's in his burial. He's in his resurrection. He's in his coming. He's to be glorified. He's cleansed in the sense that he's picked up out of this world and stuck outside the camp. He's sanctified. Our salvation, that's just a term for the process. Process. Salvation, not a process. Our sal uh, salvation is uh, the act. That's the act. Uh, remission, that's just forgiveness. When a man takes Christ as Savior, then all his sins, past, present, future, are paid for, expiated, propitiated, substituted for, and forgiven. <laughs> We start this portion of tape at 9, Hebrews 9, chapter 15. It was recorded 12 3, 1966. dollars a month for what good we're doing the town. We're going to have a little inflation around here and keep on coming in. All right, Hebrews, Hebrews 9, Hebrews 9, verse, uh, verse 15. Hebrews 9, 15. Now, last time we went into great detail about uh, full of the remission of sins. And you learn the expression, full of the remission of sins wherever it occurs. Whether it occurs in Matthew 26, in reference to the Lord's Supper, or whether it occurs in Acts 2, in reference to baptism, or whether it occurs in Romans 3, in reference to the sins that are past, or whether it occurs in Hebrews, always refers to sins that are past. The expression, full the remission of sins, never means the thing is done so you can get your sins forgiven. It always means it's done because they have been forgiven. All right, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. And for this cause he, that's Jesus, is the mediator, the middleman, of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption, not the forgiveness, not the remission, for the redemption, to buy them back, for the redemption of the transgressions, they were forgiven, but they weren't redeemed, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. They had a temporary thing back there in the Old Testament. The blood settled it, bought them back. Now they have a permanent thing. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. Uh, that is, it's like a will. When a man, what you do, don't they say this is my last will and testament? See, there's nothing old-fashioned about the Bible. The Bible's all up to date. And a man says, uh, make my last will and testament, that he makes the thing out, but that thing cannot be in effect till the man is dead. Now, when the man is dead, then it's in effect. Therefore, the New Testament is not in effect until Christ is dead. And uh, this is something that half the preachers are trying to call it or not. They didn't know when the New Testament starts. 
Uh, you have a bunch of Old Testament books to take you up to Matthew. The last one is Malachi. Genesis to Malachi. Then you have Matthew. All right, if the Testament is not in effect until the testator is dead, where does the New Testament first come into effect in Matthew? What chapter is it? 27. All right, the New Testament is not in effect till there. Therefore, the Sermon of the Mount is Old Testament. And folks, you just can't get away from that thing any way you look at it. If the Sermon of the Mount is not New Testament doctrine, the New Testament is not even in effect until three years after things preach. Yes, sir. Uh, Jesus paid for our sin. And yes. He paid it all. Who did he pay? Who did he pay? Well, <laughs> uh, he has to pay one of three things. He has to pay God. He has to pay God for a violated law. Or he has to pay the law for us breaking it. Or he has to pay the devil. And uh, the, the, uh, you have to be careful that third one, although there may be something to it. You see, the Bible says uh, we're captive, as Paul said. I'm captive to sin. All right, Christ says, I'm come to preach deliverance to the captives. He to commit a sin is the servant of sin. So the indication is that the devil's here, and you're here, the devil's got you. And that he demands a ransom for you. And the Lord comes along and pays the ransom for you, and you're free, and the ransom in that situation is paid to the devil. But you have to be careful of that theology. That can get you into some bad situations. And one of the worst it can get you into is what the Seventh-day Adventists teach that they don't have in their storybooks, the pretty pictures uh, painted by the fellow advertised Coca-Cola. But, but in their, their real textbooks that teach the doctrine, they have the teaching that the devil is, is the sin bearer. That he's the real bear. Well, doesn't all sin wind up in hell? Doesn't all sin come to the devil eventually? Well, he, he pays for it in the end, so that kind of is. And so you have to be careful of anything where, where, where the devil is given too prominent a place. And uh, if I was going to just put it down plain, I'd say the devil has you captive. And God the Father is over here for the violated law. And the devil has permission to keep those captives till the payment is made. And technically, God can't let the devil let those things go until the payment is made. And the payment is made to God the Father. And the ground of the payment being made, the devil has to let them go. See, that's a much safer system. No, it wouldn't work. Because he wound up being captive over Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. See, that, that's a dangerous thing when you get too much that devil. Yes, sir. Church of Christ says that uh, the New Testament started uh, with Jesus Christ's teaching. You know, instead of, uh, isn't that? Uh, no. Uh, 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 Church of Christ's teaching is real peculiar. Because when the dying thieves on the cross, Matthew 27 and Luke 23, uh, they say the dying thief didn't die out of the New Testament. You see, when you got a church of Christ, brothers, you say, well, you don't have to be baptized in water to be saved. And he says, yes, you do. And you say, well, the dying thief wasn't baptized in water, and he was saved. And they say, yeah, but he didn't die out of the New Testament. See? So, a Samuelite, I could continue right now. Like his New Testament begins in Acts 2. Repent and be baptized, you know. And yet, uh, you know, Camelot's full of people that have insane, I mean, they don't want to talk about three quarters of the time. And because of that, they don't know what they believe when you get them right now. I mean, you get the fellow right going, and like you say, you come right back over here in the Matthew uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, teaching Christian doctrine for Christians. He'll do it. He'll come to Matthew 7 to prove that a Christian can lose salvation. You know, many of them say to him that day, Lord, Lord, and they say, Depart from me, I never knew you. Oh, and I can't let to use that for Christian doctrine to prove a Christian who is salvation. But this fellow died under the Old Testament, and the New Testament begins here. So it's just, it's wild. It's wild. Now, we'll, we'll get it right. All right, now the New Testament is instituted in Matthew 26. It is an effect in Matthew 27. And it's not in effect till the testator is dead. All right, now, I say the dying thief was saved, but he wasn't baptized. How many say the dying thief died under the New Testament? Let me see your hand. How many say of the Old Testament? How many say he died in the middle between them? Well, 
uh, when, when, the, when the Lord dies on the cross, uh, he dies before the dying thief dies. And when the soldiers come by to break their legs, they find that Christ is dead already, so they don't break his legs. Therefore, the scripture is fulfilled, not a bone of him should be broken. You remember all that? And John? All right. If Christ's legs aren't broken because he's dead, and the other two are broken because they're alive, then the testator is dead. And if the testator is dead, the testament is in effect. The dying thief dies on the New Testament. Yes. Well, isn't it that uh, Jesus has to be raised to justify man? Well, uh, nobody understands this thing here until uh, way later. Matter of fact, Acts 8 get the understanding of it. And uh, uh, what uh, Brother Love is quoting there is a passage in Romans that says Christ was raised for our justification. Uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So that's right. That's right. So I'm pulling a kind of a scurvy trick to Campbell after doing that. But he don't know the difference between the way people are saved anyway, so it don't make a difference. In other words, that, that time he, he's saved, but he's not saved quite like we're saved. Because Christ has not come up from the dead. And Christ has no body, and he's not spiritually circumcised, and the Holy Spirit isn't in him, and he's not a part of the body of Christ, but he's saved. And he dies under the New Testament. And that's the issue. Mr. Buck, uh, or Brother Buck. Well, not quite, because when he said that, that man the palsy, uh, the blood hadn't been shed yet. When that dying, that dying thief, when he dies, the blood has been shed. That dying thief can get into heaven. The thought of leprosy and the palsy he couldn't. The dying thief can. And he goes. Of course, he has to delay it three days. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a fast shuffle there. Yes, sir. Brother man. Yeah, he did. Were they in paradise for the time Christ said that? Well, that's a, that's a future promise, isn't it? Today, thou shalt, sir. Well, well, I were not saved like the nine people say. Of course, I'll make good priests. <laughs> See, the nine people are saved by grace through faith. And you're saved by grace through faith. But I don't tell the whole story. <laughs> That's right. For I said a while ago, the dying thief could go to heaven, but he had to wait three days. And then on your thing there, you say, well, he's saved right then. Well, that's true, but he was saved right then, like, uh, like David and Moses were saved right then, which isn't a complete salvation. He isn't saved completely until the Lord's dead. The testament is not in effect till the testator is dead. And when the testator is dead, the testament is in effect. Yes, sir. People are killed by the grave in a period of minutes. They are the Jesus died. They were in the or what? I don't know. I teach they I teach they were, but I'm not sure. Some people said they went up and went back down, like Lazarus. Sir? The bodies of men that slept arose and were seen. They got some kind of a body. Yes. Is that uh, considered the law? Like when I said the law of prophets and show John? Is that considered the law when John from the dead Christ? No. There's a gap in there. It's an intermediate period. It's not considered the law. Well, <laughs> you have to, the law is, has to be still in effect because Christ dies under the law to fulfill the law. Well, that's a general. That's a general mark of dispensations. The law is still in effect. All right, Christ is the law, and the and the prophets are until John. Uh, did, did Christ say from Moses to John? Well, then it's just a general. See, mark, not specific. He's not saying that law began right here and ended right here. Specifically, yes, sir. 
Well, I don't know. We're getting off now. We're going, we're, we're warning. We're getting stray now. Let's just get back on. Now, I get one or two things clear. Uh, the New Testament is not a, in effect until here. When the dying thief dies, he dies under the New Testament. Have y'all got that? Y'all got that? All right. Well, I've been anything from Matthew chapter 1 to Matthew 27. Technically, and I'm being technical, but if you want to get your doctrine straight, you've got to get technical. Technically, anything from Matthew 1 to Matthew 27 takes place in an Old Testament situation. And that's why Matthew is a dangerous book. It's a dangerous book. All right, Hebrews chapter 9, verse uh, 16. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is no strength at all while the testator liveth. Therefore, the fellow healed leprosy or palsy, it's not an effect on him. See? It's of no strength at all while Christ is alive. It's of no strength till he's dead. Whereupon neither the first testament, back in Moses, was dedicated without blood. For when Moses has spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves, goats, with water, notice water connected with the blood, and scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people. So he took water and blood to sprinkle to clean it. So that's why people connect water baptism with the blood of Christ, and that's why they sprinkle water for baptism in a lot of churches. Uh, verse 20, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you, uh, joined you to, uh, have set up for you, given to you, hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Uh, did you ever stop and think what a, what a bloody, that, what a bloody thing that was? That means that there was blood on the tabernacle, blood on this, blood on that, blood on that, blood on that, blood on that, blood on all that thing. Uh, People don't, they don't realize how bloody that thing was. You realize they, they sacrificed one lamb every morning and one lamb every night as a regular sacrifice, and then everybody had a sin bottle offering, and everybody had a gift bottle offering. There's just rivers of blood running around that thing. Just blood all over it. Uh, and then the blood was sprinkled here and there and there and there and there and there and there and finally sprinkled on the mercy seat. It's a bloody book. It's a bloody book. A man said, if you want to find out if the Bible's a Bible doctrine, he said, stab it and see if it bleeds. And if it bleeds, it's Bible. And if it doesn't, it's not. If there's no blood in it, it isn't salvation. And that's one of the great things that's submitted to modern day preaching is preaching on the blood. I've heard all kinds of stuff preached on the radio lately, and, and people send me all kinds of magazines and things, and all kinds of sermons. Uh, is, that, is that a Billy Graham picture there? An hour to see? Let's see what he says about the blood. Just check it out. Uh, you, know, you know what the modern invitation is? It's this. It's uh, give your life to Christ. Uh, nervous tension, trouble in Iraq and Iran and Turkey, you need to get adjusted. Uh, trouble in Japan, trouble in Vietnam, you're living in high tension days today in Moscow, so and so said, and don't take tranquilizers and run down do loud delinquents. What you need is Christ, total commitment to Christ, give your life to Christ. Everybody come forward. That's it, folks. That's it. That's the plan of salvation being given out today. It wouldn't save a dead horse either. Uh, let's see, Lord of Christmas. This is starting on the front. Uh, yeah, but I want, to, I want to get his invitation. The last thing a man says for the invitation is what you want to get. Uh, uh, and this Christmas season, Jesus Christ can make all the difference in the world, in your home, and in your life. How about your body? Folks, they let Christ come into your life. Well, he's the devil, why? Right? <laughs> Did you ever hear folks say, give your life to God, you know? How about your body? You live your life in your body. If he has your life and doesn't have your body, he hasn't got your life. If he's got your body, he's got your life. Uh, those who have truly caught a vision of the Christ of Christmas <laughs> have become possessed by a spirit yes. of high purpose. I am convinced that Christ alone, as he said, the way, the truth, and the life for our nation is collective, our home is collective, our personal lives. He is the source of spiritual for, uh, uh, he is the source of spiritual fortification. Jesus Christ can come into your heart at this wonderful season, fill the aching void, forgive your sins, transform your life, and make you a new person. Now that's true. 
But you know something? There's no atonement. There's no blood. There's no pain. See? It's kind of a thing where uh, you have a need, Christ will take care of the need, let him in, and he's in. Amen. Uh, you're going to hell, you need a payment. Boy, it'll be a Christmas message. <laughs> you're going to hell, ring out the bells. <laughs> Yeah, put Christ in Christmas. Well, all these are nice gestures, you see. But they don't do enough to them. Uh, no, there's no, there's no, there's no salvation. Now, there's some nice thoughts, and there's some Christian sayings, and there's some Christian ideas. There's no salvation. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah, he sure did. Uh, verse, uh, uh, verse 19. Yeah. Well, how about that? Blood on the people. Blood on the book. On the book. See? You take a Bible that has the word blood out of it. Colossians 1, 14. It's not a Bible. Our blood's on the book. Uh, you know, back in the old days, they'd make all the edges of the book red so you know it was bloody. Look at the color and edge of your paper there. It's just red. Red. Red and black. Red and black. You ever somebody say, put that down in your little black book? <laughs> right, that's, that's the book. Black's for the sin, the red's for the blood. Uh, Hebrews 9, uh, verse 21. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Blood's used every time. And without shedding of blood is no remission. Now notice that doesn't say, without the shedding of Christ's blood is no remission. That's just saying there's no remission unless blood is shed. Well, they shed blood. So there was remission in the Old Testament. But there wasn't redemption, 15, and there wasn't clearing, Exodus 34, and there wasn't complete atonement. However, there was remission through blood. Through blood. 23, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in heaven should be purified with these. But the heavenly things, these, uh, with uh, better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands here, which are figures of the truth, but into heaven itself, right in there, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Uh, nor yet that he should offer himself often. Uh, he says, uh, back in the Old Testament, a uh, priest yet in the morning, cut the lamb's throat. Go to the tabernacle at night, cut the lamb's throat. All day long, a fellow brings in uh, two turtle doves and a pigeon. What are these for? Well, my wife just had a baby boy. Ring off the neck, out comes the blood. Here comes the fellow in, offers an offering. What's this for? I've just been cleansed of leprosy. All right, cut off his head, out comes the blood. And that fellow is standing there just butchering and, and barbecuing all day long at that order. And that blood's just running and running and running. And the writer of Hebrews says, Christ wasn't like that. Christ didn't offer it, and then offer it, and then offer it, and then offer it, and then offer it. He just offered it once. And uh, the Vatican uh, manuscript, manuscript B, that is the West Court text for the ASV, and the RSV, and the RV stops at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, the Greek text. Whoever had that manuscript for those Bibles in the Greek text didn't like what followed Hebrews 9, 14. And what follows Hebrews 9, 14 is one sacrifice. One. Whoever messed up that Bible wanted to offer sacrifice every Sunday morning. Again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And it's not going to be offered again. It's just offered once. Sir? Verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own body, that and once the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And if you want this eternal redemption, the way you do it is come to Mass Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, and get it through the Church of Christ found. Oh, yeah, see, it's just... Boy, you know, do you know when somebody gets fouled up in Scripture, did you know they get where they can't read one verse right? I marvel sometimes, you know. I don't listen to Cam right much anymore. I, I, I listen to him just long enough to see how much time he waits trying to, you know, uh, uh, defend himself. So much of his program he throws away. And, uh, you know, in, in all the years I've listened to Campbellites here, up in Baymanette and around the country, I've never heard one yet that could expound one verse of Scripture correctly. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. They couldn't get one verse. 
The 31,000 verses in the Bible. But you know, when you get hung up or something, you get where nothing works. I mean, suppose you're a Calvinist. You read, uh, whosoever will, let him go. You say, whosoever will, the elect. So you can't get that right. And if a man's a candlelight, reads that water in there, for God so the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And how do we show folks that we believe? We show we believe when we obey, because he became the author of eternal life for those of the man. And Peter said in Acts chapter 2, repent me, but see, I'm just... There's no cure for it. There's no cure for it. That's right, just go around the circle. Yes, sir. I do have to go ask Sam about the word of the said, uh, all about being saved or baptized. That's a low blow. <laughs> yeah, because I can done the same. You'd be saved to drink of life. But you can change to drink of life. But that's all right. I think it's legitimate for them. Yes, sir. <laughs> No, no, the English uh, copies your King James Bible from then on, so you'll think it's a Bible, but the Greek text they came from do not have it. They've got to use a receptus Greek to get the rest of it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, verse what? According to the law, what? I may almost say. I may almost say that, that, that all things are purged by uh, I may almost say that all things by the law are with blood, as I read. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Well, they'll, they'll fool the verse to deal with the blood. Verse, uh, 20, verse 25, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest and at the holy place every year with blood of others. Now the blood of the other sacrifices they gave him. For then, if Christ had to die again and again and again, for then, if that's true, must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, underline it, once. Once. But now, once. In the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin for the sacrifice of himself. And as is appointed to men under it, once to die, but after this judgment, so Christ was under it, once offered to bear the sins of many. Once offered to bear the sins of many. And from those verses come right down to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. Hebrews 10, 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once. 10, 10. For all. Once. And come from there right down to verse 12. But this man after it offered one sacrifice for sins forever. <coughs> Sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Verse 14. For by, underline it, for by one offering he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, you wouldn't think a thing could be any clearer than that, would you? See, one offering, once, once and for all, suffered once, appeared once, to put away sin once, by offering himself once. And in spite of that, you have a bunch of people in America that every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock offer him again and again and again and again and again and talk about being Christians. Well, it's absolutely ridiculous. A Christian couldn't buy that thing for five minutes. It's once. It's once. Now, when I used to go to St. Michael's, I'll show you what the priest taught me about the sacrifice. Then we'll get on down to the Hebrews 10 and look at it in detail. But here's what he said. He said that Malachi had said a pure offering would be offered in his name among the Gentiles. And he said this. He said that the Lord suffered when Christ held up the cup and said, This is the New Testament, my blood, drink you all of it. This is my body, broken in remembrance to this remembrance of me. Uh, he said that the elements of the supper were the literal blood. This is my blood. And literal body in that prayer. Then he said when Christ died on the cross, his literal body and his literal blood was offered as a sacrifice to sin. And then he said in the Mass, Sunday morning, when you came there, that sacrifice was reproduced in a bloodless fashion. That's a, that's a masterpiece. Did you realize that, man? 
And you know what he said? He said, all oh, these three are the same. He said, these three are the same. And he said, they're continued down through the church throughout the ages, and they're all the same thing. That's what he said. And then he said, Sunday morning is a repetition of the sacrifice in, under a bloodless form. And I said, well, when he held up that cup, he said, see, oh, my, oh, me, perfect, human, and all that. I said, does, he, does, he, does, 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 does that uh, wine become the blood of Christ? He says, to the eyes of the faithful, yes. I said, that broken bread, does that become the body of Christ? He said, to the eyes of the faithful, yes. He said, it's a continuation. He said, this is a continuation of this, and this is a continuation of this. And even though Christ was only offered once, it was a continuation of this. And this is a continuation of that. That's the situation. Now, just, uh, just lest we let all the religious uh, stuff kind of draw us out of our common senses, let's notice some things about these three that are entirely different. You might write them down somewhere. At the supper, there are twelve apostles present. At the mass, there are no apostles present. Uh, it's a different thing. At the, at, at the mass, there are no apostles present. How many apostles are present at Golgotha? One. one. Oh, John. There's one. All right. At the, at the, at the last supper, when Christ is given the, the uh, instruction, he has the fruit of the vine. New wine. Matthew 26. At Golgotha, he has literal blood running out on the ground, and the mass, you have fermented liquor. How can this be a continuation of this, and this a continuation of this, when they're not the same? They're not the same. All right, and this particular one here, Christ's body is alive, seated at the table. In this one here, he is dead.
No, he can't be an American Catholic. All Catholics are Roman Catholics. Do you know that? No such thing as American Catholic. There's a Roman Catholic. All right, if all Roman Catholics are Roman, they're not Catholic. And if they're Catholic, they're not just Roman. You just think Catholic means everywhere, universal, all around. Why, right, if that was all around universal, he's not limited to Rome, and he's limited to Rome, he's not clean around. You see that? So if it's above the sacrifice, there's no blood in it. But if it's continuation of blood, there is blood in it. So it's above the sacrifice with blood that has no blood in it. That's what it is. That's right. That's what it is. And I'll tell you, the closest, folks, uh, as close you can get to the, the born-again Christian and bust hell wide open is, uh, is, is, is the Roman Catholic profession. They profess everything that every fundamental school in the United States professes to believe. And they believe in the blood. Well, they can give a better witness to the blood than some of you Christians do. Did you ever hear the confraternity of the precious blood? And the, 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 uh, the, some monastery called the, the, the bleeding heart of Mary, or the precious blood of Jesus. Why, you talk about the precious blood, why, you find that thing all over Cincinnati and St. Louis. They believe in the blood. It's just bloodless. Follow that. And just, uh, it's like saying a fellow's a big, small, fat, yellow, brown dog cat pineapple. <laughs> That'd be real good. I wish everybody would do that in this town. Find all the priests. Phone them up. Say, what must do to be saved? Yeah. All right. That'd be good. Well, I, I, I guess what he'll tell you. Of course, that's it. I don't know what he'd say. You'd get different ones. You might hit one than one say. Yeah, you might hit someone that was saved, one that was saved, he'd say, believe the Lord Jesus Christ, now shall be saved. I mean, some of them know the, I mean, some of them know what a primary identification Bible school students don't know. But most of them would say, well, we need to obey the commandments of God. And he'd say, obey the, obey the commandments of God, we must be obedient to Christ. And Christ uh, told us how we could please him and obey him, and then upon this rock I'll build my church. Yes, foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world, in the sense of age, in the sense of time, a time period, but now once at the end of the, of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, compare the end of this verse, he appeared not merely to pay for sin, which he did, and to bear sin, which he did, to put away sin. And John says, take it away. Now look at John chapter 1, verse uh, uh, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. All right, if Christ bears sin, becomes sin, takes away sin, and puts away sin, then he got to take it somewhere and got to put it. Uh, look, at, uh, look at Hebrews 9, 28. We'll see what he did with it. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Bear. Put them away and bear. Bear the sins of many. Out of them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. All right, if the first time Christ came, he bore sin. And the next time he comes, he is without sin. Then he had to do something with the sins between the time he took them and the time he comes back. And the way this thing works is Christ dies on the cross for your sins. And on the cross he says, Father, in thy hands I commend my spirit. Spirit goes up. Body goes into the grave. Uh, Joseph found the theist too. The uh, soul goes down. Uh, Acts chapter 2 says his soul was not left in hell. Neither did his flesh see corruption. And he comes down in the Sheol. 
And when he goes to Sheol, he goes through both parts. He goes through hell, Hades, and then he goes over here to Abraham's bosom, then he comes back up. And his primary purpose in going over here is to preach deliverance to the captives, to proclaim the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament that they were to recall might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Out they go, so the sins of faithful. Yes, sir. Body is dead, man. No, no. Three days later, it comes out. When he beat his body, he came back. When he comes back up. Oh, the soul went on. Yeah, that's it. Was he here and sold his body then? When, when he arose? Was he what? Was he here and soul and body? That's right. That's right. Soul and body. Then they both went up the same time. That's right. I just thought that Aaron will actually come back up through here in the grave. All right, now, but his primary purpose in going down here is to leave what he bore. The last time he was there, you know what he was? He was sin for you. He was a serpent. John chapter 3. As Moses looked up the serpent of the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Cursed is he to hang on a tree. Christ bore our sins in his own body on the cross, that we being dead to sin might live in the righteousness, by whose stripes are he. Why, when he, the last time he's here, he has it all over him, and it becomes sin in your place, my place, and then he goes down, and when he comes back up, there's nothing on him. He says, Magdalene, don't touch me. That's going up yet. And he goes up. And he goes up, the work is completed. The sins are taken care of, they're taken away, and they're put away. And back up he comes. And when he comes the second time, there's no sin on him. Yes, sir. Well, that'll be the connection. And I, if I ever, uh, technically, if a, a sinner touched him again, though there's an interruption in the work. See, the work has been paid for, completed, dumped, and then the report is reported back in. Did he what? Oh, yes, yes. Yes, sir. He went up and came back. It's about two hours. Now, brother, that's moving. That's moving. I don't know physics enough to know how fast that is. That must be better than 100 million light years per second. Children that uh, uh, did that, you know, say, uh, seem to me like I've used that once, once. You, you said, don't you, once for all, once for the last time? After, yeah, when you say once for all, you mean this is the last time you're going to hear about it and it ain't going to be anymore, see? Yes, sir. Is that right? Okay. All right, once. That's it. Uh, Eleven, and every priest, and this is down here on the ground, standing daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices underlined, there's your Catholic Church, which can never take away sins. Boy, you can go to that Mass every Sunday morning, 11, that confessional every Saturday night at 10 o'clock. I was told one of the members recently that was, 
I forget who it was, he went to some Catholic church to see a wedding or something, and one of them fell into the confessional booth. <laughs> there was a priest in there. I'm real mad at him, you know, because they're coming to confess something. They just slipped and tripped, you know, fell into the booth. <laughs> and you can, go to that, uh, you can go to that confession every Saturday night, that Mass every Sunday morning, and never get your sins taken away. So when you ask a Catholic to be saved, he says, I hope so. See, I guess I am. Well, I think I am. Well, have you received Christ? Oh, yeah, we receive him every Sunday morning. You see why I receive him every Sunday? Because his sins are still there. All right, uh, which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, but this man, after he had offered one, not two, one sacrifice for sins under life forever, there's no continuation to it. That one sacrifice is an eternal sacrifice forever. Sat down on the right hand of God. The work's finished. Sat down. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering, not three of them, or not a continued, for by one offering he hath perfected, there's that word again, doesn't mean sinless, see, perfected, made complete, finished it. Hath he perfected forever, forever, it's done, it's complete, forever, them that are sanctified, back up verse 10, those set apart. That is, when a man when a man comes to hear, this thing here is a is a blood bank for sinners. It's outside the camp. It's set apart. Why don't you go out that blood bank? You come out that blood bank and draw your blood from there. You're set apart, and you're set apart forever. See, because this sacrifice is once and for all and forever. It's complete. It can never be repeated. It can never be continued. And I gave you an illustration about uh, three weeks ago, I think about uh, Moses back in the Old Testament, hitting that rock, you know. Uh, the Lord said, speak to it, and he hit it. And he wasn't supposed to hit it, he was supposed to speak to it. And yet the first time, he didn't have to hit it. So Christ once smitten, Christ is struck, and the wrath of God is on him, and once struck, you don't ever have to strike him again. So you don't go back and offer him up again, and say, this is his blood, and drink the old blood, and eat the old corpse again. That's what that business is. You're not a cannibal. You don't have to go back and do that thing over and over and over again. All you have to do for future cleansing is speak. See? You say, Lord, uh, I've done wrong. Forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me. You speak to the rock. You don't hit it. Yes, sir. Does the blood have anything to do with people getting sick? Does blood have anything to do with people getting sick? Does the blood have anything to do Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a connection, any kind of blood there's a connection. And also accounts why, even though uh, the blood makes people sick, uh, people look for it uh, instinctively. They look for it. People that go out on a, uh, a, a highway for the car wreck, you know, they look all over, they're looking for blood. It's, it's instinct. And uh, they'll do it in boxing matches, as well as they watch boxers, you know, on TV. And they watch a man's, uh, they watch your left glove. How many of you fellows know what I'm talking about? Watch your left glove. Right. Let's see if it's shiny. That's right. It's just automatic as it can be. Yeah, blood has a, it has a fascination. Ma'am? Yeah. yeah. All right, uh, we're about through. Let's, let's, no, let's go back to Hebrews 9. No, we can't, we can't tangle with this either. Hebrews 9, 27. It is appointed a man who wants to die, but after this the judgment. That's a good verse to use in personal work, and I use it. But you don't ever uh, cling to it too much doctrinally. Uh, Lazarus died twice. Jonah died twice. Jairus' daughter died twice. The widow of Nain's son died twice. The Shunammite's son died twice. Dorcas died twice. Eutychus died twice. See? You have to be careful. Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews, folks, you have to be careful. Yes? Yep. Yeah. He came up from paradise. And he couldn't say what had happened to him in his there either, which indicates that they did sleep in the Old Testament. But they don't sleep anymore. Something like that. Uh, all right, all right. Yes, sir. The verse says, though, that it's appointed. I mean, uh, it doesn't say it's not set down in law, is it? 
Yeah, that's right. The catch is this is an illustration. Look at the illustration. And as that is Mr. Son, so Christ was in the Son. See? It's an illustration. It's not a doctrinal truth. But it'll preach. It'll preach. Uh, it is the point of man wants to die, and after this the judgment. Uh, you, you know it's not doctrinally true because uh, some of you may never die. As a matter of fact, you folks under 30, I have no doubt at all about you're not going to die. It's not the point under you to die. You're going to be caught up. Just a question over here. Yeah, that's a, that's a little reading in there. It isn't in there. And there's a point of men once to die, but after this, the judgment. But it's a general truth. And death is not as certain as judgment. Do you ever stop to think about that? Uh, they say the only thing you can be sure of is death and taxes. But uh, did you know there's one thing more certain than death? Judgment. Because even if you don't die and if the Lord were to come, you're still going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. So there's something that's more important than death, and that's judgment. Uh, like uh, I use this on a fellow, well, I read it, some old preacher used it, but it was real good. I've used it a lot of times when people talk about suicide. And a fellow told me one time, he said, I, I, I want to die, I want to end it all. I said, you'll die and face it all. And that's right. That's right. Because there's a point of man wants to die and after this, the judgment. When you die, you don't end it all, you face it. And as it is a point of man wants to die, but after this, the judgment, so forth and so on. Uh, I've got a note that says, any education that dulls this God-given conviction has eternal significance. And that's the way of saying, uh, any education that makes you forget that you're headed for judgment is going to make an eternal difference in your welfare, whether you're saved or lost. That's something to think about. Any teaching, I don't care if it's even Christian teaching, any teaching that makes you forget that you're headed for a judgment has eternal significance. That's right. Yes, sir. What's a good set of verses for showing that people are not sleeping down in paradise? Our best one is First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. For Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Yes, sir. No, no, in the Old Testament they're conscious. The man of hell says, Father Abraham, give me and send Lazarus, and Lazarus never answers. All right, that's all, folks. Lord bless you. Try to make it out of church tomorrow. The following was recorded 12 17 1966. There was no school on 11 19 and 12 10, and there will be no school 12 24, and we will pick up again on January the 14th. the fact that Christ died once and made a complete atonement. But we haven't yet finished the passage back in Hebrews 9. So we'll go back to Hebrews chapter 9 and pick it up in verse 26. Yes, sir. Uh, Hebrews and Matthew? Yeah, let's see. This is the last, uh, this is the last Saturday night, isn't it? All right. Everything through Hebrews 9. And everything from Matthew 6. <coughs> yeah? Uh, did we finish Matthew? We finished Matthew tonight, didn't we? 
Before we leave here tonight, you all tired just a minute. Let me give you the summary on Matthew 6 and Hebrews 9. All right, Hebrews 9, verse 26. For then must he, and he is Jesus, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. If that was true, if he had to keep dying, then he had to suffer over and over again, but that isn't true. But now once in the end of the world, in the sense of the, the, the time, the age, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and of them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin and the salvation. Now the passage is plainly a tribulation passage uh, by the statement of He says, it is appointed men once to die, but after this the judgment. And I've used that in personal work all my life. And I'll keep on using it all my life, as long as I live. But uh, men, some men don't die. It is not appointed a man that wants to die in a doctrinal sense. Uh, it, it's a general sense. As, as it is appointed a man wants to die after judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. See, it's a comparison. Now, I'll show you how you know it's not a doctrine. Uh, here's Christ dying on the cross. He appears, he puts away sin with the sacrifice of himself. He bears your sins, he becomes sin, he puts it away, put away sin. He takes the sin down there and he dumps them. He comes back up, he goes up to the Father, back down on the earth 40 days, 40 nights, back up, some days coming again. All right? Uh, the writer of Hebrews says when he comes this time, uh, to those that look for him, he shall appear without sin. Now this means that whoever sees him, uh, the last time they saw him, they saw him with it. So you can't, you can't get that thing any other way. Unto them that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin. That couldn't be a reference to you. Why did he say to you, the second time you see him, he shall appear without sin? He doesn't have any sin now. He didn't have any you met him. And when he rose from the dead and appeared to the disciples, he didn't have any sin on him. He was sinless then. He dumped the sins. All right, he appeared only to save people. That means that whoever saw him here saw him with sin on him, and that's the last time they saw him. Israel. Israel. And the next time they see him, they're going to see him without sin. So it's plenty of tribulation passage. Now there's some more things on him. Uh, he went down, died, he left your sins here, went back up, next time he comes, he comes without sin to them that look for him. And to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin and salvation. Alright? He appeared the first time, and to those that look for him he shall appear the second time. Now you see in both those cases, it's comparing the first time somebody saw him was the second time they're going to see him. Now, uh, you never saw him the first time. You're not a Hebrew. You're a Christian. You didn't see him the first time. And uh, when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came into you, and uh, you're waiting for Christ to come, and you're waiting for Christ to come in the air, not on the ground. And if this thing says, to them that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin and salvation. If that applies to you now in the church age, what about those Christians who aren't looking for it? That's right, they'll be left. You have a split rapture. And that's why a lot of the colleges now, without officially stating it, their faculties are teaching a post tribulation rapture. They don't say it in the creed, the faculty at least slips it in. And that's from Pastor in Hebrews. All right, now in this age here, when Christ comes, how many Christians are going to be caught up, folks? Oh. All of them. Now, if all of them don't go up, then it's part of Christ's body stays behind. If part of his body stays behind, he's mutilated. He's mutilated. Why, Christ isn't going to be mutilated again. He mutilated once. He had holes put in. The side was pierced, but he's not going to be mutilated again. The body is called a pearl of great price. You take one chip out of it, it's mutilated. There's going to be one Christian left behind, including the Christians who aren't looking for him. Make beautiful preaching, though, see. He said, I want to tell you folks, the only kind of people are going to get caught up are those who are looking for Christ. I want to tell you, friend, if you're shooting a pool in the pool hall, how in the world can you look for him? You know what I'm saying? You go on through there, you can get half the Christians caught up and half of them left. But when Christ comes, they're all going out, 
And that's humorous. See, that's, uh, that's funny when you think about it. Folks just don't think about it. It means that Christians will be caught up who weren't looking for him and don't believe he's coming. I mean, what if that candlelight down there really is saved? <laughs> I mean, I don't think he is, but what if he is? <laughs> I think some of them are. I've met Church of Christ people, I believe, will say they don't believe in a rapture. See? Wouldn't it be horrible not to believe it and be caught up? I wonder what you think. <laughs> I mean, you about die the second death of a heart attack on the way up. Wonder what on earth was going on, you know. You'd just be walking along and shoot. <laughs> You'd be about 25,000 feet in the air going up there like a bullet. And you couldn't, you wouldn't want to walk those. You thought they were casting out of darkness. Yeah, he's got a guy, he's got a guy on the call this morning down there. I didn't hear him this morning. He was talking about this. He was once, he was in the middle of the night. He was born something like that. He was always, you know, he got a preaching from God. He was born in the time out of the world. Found that sooner or later, brother. You can't keep fooling that book without preaching some truth. I've heard him sometimes try to mess something up, quote three or four verses, just as plain and nice you ever heard before in your life. I thought, bless God, thank God for that, boy. Somebody got a hold of that come through it. <laughs> but now this thing here, see, this thing here is aimed for somebody uh, who's looking for him. And he'll appear to them the second time without sin to salvation, and if they're not looking for him, they're left. Now, if they doubt about it, turn to Matthew 25 and watch him get left. Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verse 1. In the tribulation, a man has to be looking for him, or he's left. Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of God. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to ten virgins. Not virgins. Ten virgins. I read about 144,000 virgins in Revelation, but the church is one virgin, the spouse of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 to 2. Matthew 25, 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth not to marry the bridegroom, but to meet the bridegroom. Not to marry him, but to meet him. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tired, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight... There was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, not marry him. And all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. You know the rest of it. Uh, look at verse 10. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he said, uh, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know not neither the day nor the hour, when the Son of Man cometh. So there's a rapture here. There's a rapture here of church-age saints that go up to marry the bridegroom. There's a rapture here of tribulation saints that go up to meet the bridegroom. The rapture here is for all the members of the body of Christ, caught up, regardless of whether they're looking for him or not. This bunch here is caught up by the bunch that are looking for him. And the ones that aren't looking for him are left. And how long this interval is between here and here, I do not know. It might be a mid-tribulation rapture. It might be a 30-day period. It might be a 60-day period. It might be a 90-day period. And that's that odd period, you know, we talked about before when we went through Revelation. You know, that nobody ever got figured out. There's an intermediate period right before the advent and the rapture that nobody's ever got figured out yet. And it's in Daniel when you finally find it. Yes, sir. The marriage is before the second coming. Yes. Why does it refer to uh, him still being a bridegroom coming? The bridegroom coming? Yeah, that's a good question, isn't it? Uh, but verse 10, And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. So he's a bridegroom who hadn't been married yet. I thought the marriage took place before Well, according to this thing here, now, now that's the trouble of this time, Ellen. You see, if that's mid-tribulation, look what you got. Up go the Christians. Well, here it is over here. Now, you see that thing there? You've got the Christian caught up on another chart that, uh... Well, you know, here, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that 
there. Now, the Christian, this line here, is this line here. Judge at the judgment seat of Christ, marriage of the Lamb here. Now, I've got this post-tribulation rapture over here, see, caught up after the marriage. It indicated that they're caught up before the Lord lands. Now, that rapture may be right there, in which case they're caught right up to the marriage. And I compromise, I put the marriage right here in the center, so they can be caught up right at the end of it, see, at the end of the tribulation. Because if I understand my Bible right, it is at the end of the tribulation, but it could be wrong. There could be a mid be a mid tribulation rapture of tribulation saints in the middle. Yes, sir. Are these Jews or Gentiles? Oh, I'm sure of the Jews. I'm not sure of the Gentiles. Yes. Will these people form a part of the body of Christ? No, sir. No, sir. Body of Christ left over here. Body's gone. Yes, sir. Lord, last time I have a notice that when the virgins of 25 uh, go, the bridegroom's already married, just like he just said. Remember what you gave that reference for? Well, no, but I've got it drawn that way. I've got him married here, and then drawn to the marriage after the marriage is over. Still call a bride, you know he's married? Yes. Are you call a woman is married? Well, a, man, a, man, a bride is called a bride before she's married, when she's married, and after she's married. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. Uh, Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse uh, 27. And as it is appointed a man once to die, but after this judgment. Now here's the problem here. He said it is appointed a man once to die, but that's only an illustration. Now, to show you how that's only an illustration, Jairus' daughter dies twice. The widow of Maiden's son dies twice. Eutychus dies twice. Dorcas dies twice. Jonah dies twice. The Shunammite son dies twice. There are a whole bunch of people who die twice. Um, Eutychus, you know, fell out of the window when Paul was preaching. He got kind of long-winded, and Eutychus went to sleep and fell out the window, and the Lord and Paul resurrected him. But Eutychus is not alive today. He died twice. Uh, Dorcas was a you know good woman that did good deeds, and uh, she was lying in the upper room uh, ready for burial, and Peter went up and raised her from the dead. But she's not alive today. She died again. Lazarus died and was buried and came out of the tomb and dropped dead again. So when you say it is appointed a man wants to die, that's a general truth. See, that's not a doctrinal truth. You can't say this is Bible doctrine. Man has to die once. That's a lie. It's a lie. It's a general truth, but it's not a doctor. Yes, sir. Uh, were those people really dead, like Lazarus? Man, he wasn't dead. I don't know what in the world. Where was he at? Was he in heaven? Well, he began to die. The body began to decompose. But he actually was in the, his uh, soul was in the final resting state and he came back again? I'd say so, yeah. I'd say his soul was in Abraham's soul. He was asleep. Yes, sir, he was asleep. Who? Jerry is the dark? I suppose so. Let's get on something. I don't know about the salvation of those people. Yes, sir. What about these people that uh, get uh, drowned? Get what? Drowned. Drowned. Oh, I like to do something like that. They're getting the lungs full of water. What about? Dragonfly. I want to say Dragonfly. You mean are they really dead? Well, technically they're not dead until the soul leaves them. A doctor can pronounce him dead, but a man isn't dead that Bible where his soul was left. Genesis 35. All right, now here are two. Now here are cases where some over here. Yes, I, uh, I got a question. I've never got cleared up on this thing of when uh, uh, Christ was uh, crucified. Where he, when he went to paradise, did he go there from paradise through hell and leave the sins there and take the place? Yes. With him, yes, he goes he goes through Hades here, hell here, leaves the sin, steps over here, opens the door, takes him out. All right, now you got these uh, double deaths here. Now folks, if if some people in the Bible die twice and they do, then they must there must be a reason for it. Uh, for example, Enoch in the Bible uh, never died and never will die. So the hat, he has to be a picture of somebody, I and mean, nothing without significance. <laughs> God doesn't catch a man up alive uh, that never dies just to, just to be humorous. <laughs> There's a point in it. All right. Enoch goes up and Enoch never died and never will die. 
Therefore, Enoch is a picture of a Christian who's living when Christ comes. You see, if the Lord Jesus would come right now, you'd be caught up. And you'd be caught up alive, and then you never would die again. Because when you're caught up, you become just like Jesus. Then you become judge. You're sinlessly perfect, and you come down to reign on earth with him, just like him. Uh, for whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of the Son. So your problem's over. You can't die again. You can't even die once if you're caught up. If the Lord were to come tonight, you couldn't possibly ever die. Because you'd be just like Jesus Christ. All right, so then your type in the Bible is Enoch. Enoch never died. Enoch never will die. But now you've got some problems. Here's a man named Elijah, and he was caught up without dying, but in the tribulation he dies. Revelation chapter 11. So you've got one man in the Bible who goes up alive, but has to die later. Elijah, therefore, is a picture of a tribulation saint who was caught up without dying. Elijah is a picture of a tribulation saint who is caught up without dying. Why is that Moses Now, you got to watch out for Moses. He dies twice. What's Elijah? Elijah only died once. Yeah, but I see a picture of a tribulation saint. Well, a tribulation saint going to die twice. I mean, die again. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Moses dies twice. We'll get Moses in a minute. Yeah, but I'm talking about Elijah. Well, I've already been to Elijah. He was caught up alive and died later. One of the tribulation saints going to die. What are they going to die? Later. In the millennium. Millennium. All right, now we'll take Moses. Now Moses' case, the case of a man who died and was buried and then was hauled out and then going to drop dead again. You get too complicated, y'all? What I hope is real simple. Look at here. Just answer me yes or no. Was Elijah caught up without dying? Is he going to die later? Yeah. All right, now you've got to find a man somewhere who's going to be caught up without dying, but is going to die later. Uh, if you're caught up without dying, can you die later? Then that ain't the type. It's over here. See that? I mean, if Elijah is caught up and then dies later, he cannot be a picture of a Christian who's caught up, because when a Christian's caught up, he doesn't die later. Right? All right. Then he's a picture of somebody here who's caught up and dies later. Yes, sir. Those people get caught up in Revelation 11 get killed in Revelation 11, don't they? Uh, yeah, they do. That's when Elijah's going to die, Revelation 11. Well, the people right? that are caught up, do they, do they die before they're caught up? Some do and some don't. They die before they're caught up, they die twice. And I will get that. So you all, you all try to, you try to rush me. You try to get Moses and Elijah confused. Now get it one time. Enoch is a picture of a Christian who's caught up and never will die. Elijah is a picture of a tribulation saint who's caught up and will die later. Now Moses, Moses died and was buried and then taken out and then he's going to die later again. Revelation 11. Therefore Moses is a picture of a man who is killed in the tribulation. That takes care of the thing you just gave. Killed in the tribulation. And then comes up and goes to millennium and drops dead again. Why did he drop dead in millennium? Because he has to die twice because it's a common occurrence. And those, those folks in the Bible that died twice, Eutychus, Dorcas, Jairus' son, the widow of Nain, the Shunammite son, Lazarus, those are types of people in tribulation who die once, come up, and then die twice. And as a matter of fact, they'd die three or four times. If the Lord didn't have a cure for them, the cure is the tree of life. Yes, sir. The reason why they die is because when you draw a line right there, nobody after there ever gets a glorified body. You see, everybody is taken for granted. Everybody comes up in the resurrection as a glorified body, but that's nonsense. The only people who have a glorified body are people who are part of the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is gone. They do have a body, though. They have a body. Yeah, when Lazarus came out, he had a body. When Jonah came up, he had a body. But it died. It died. <laughs> Sir? 
That's right. That's that's it. That's it exactly. And now we got it. That's it. See, that's it. What I'm trying to say, nobody gets a glorified body. Except those in the church. That's it. That's it. That's just it. They have these uh uh these groups of the life. Not the millennium. I said eternity. Yes, sir. Uh the tribulation saints uh they can't get in heaven yet. They got to meet they got to be the Lord they are. Because if they, if they don't have a resurrected body, they don't have their uh their No, but, but Moses and Elijah are caught up to heaven. They didn't have a resurrected body. They have a blood? <laughs> Y'all getting too deep for me now. I can't, no, no, I, no, I, 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 just, I can't go there. I'll, I'll come back to this, yeah. but uh, what's, how can they I don't know that. What their condition was. But it says the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. <laughs> yeah, well they weren't inheriting the kingdom of God, they were just up in heaven. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Sir? Why are we so special? Why are we so special? Because, brother, we're a special people. <laughs> That's right. We're, we're a people, we're a people that, are, that, are, that are saved by grace through faith plus nothing. And nobody else is. And in order to get saved by grace through faith plus nothing, we have to give up all kinds of privileges. We have to give up signs. Wonders, miracles, and we have to give up walking by sight. We have to walk by faith. We're a special people. Yes, sir. Suppose to die in the millennium, could you tell what happens to the soul of the saved and lost? Brother, I sure could. No, I'm just dealing with just simple. I'm dealing with one verse. It is appointed to men once to die. I know nothing.